Good morning, good morning. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started. I know that we had some te technical difficulties with the link, I apologize. Have no idea, but someone did make a great comment that quantum computing will solve this problem. So hopefully we can figure that out. It has never happened before. So again, I apologize. And we typically get started at 11 o'clock on the dot. And I just wanted to wait a few minutes. We do have a good crowd on here already. So we'll go ahead and get started. So I want to welcome you to this week's Purdue at Westgate Defense in Indiana webinar series. My name is Samantha Nelson, and I'm the program manager for the Purdue Foundry here at Westgate. We at Purdue at Westgate strive to promote business and talent growth, and we want to help support you as a startup, a small business, and academia. We strive to be the regional hub of connection and support, and Purdue at, Purdue at Westgate is located at the West, Westgate Academy. Now, the Westgate Academy is a technology incubator, training, and office conference center that is located within the Westgate at Crane Technology Park, which is directly outside the gates of the Naval Support Activity Center in Crane, Indiana. We are very proud to say that just within our small area within the Westgate at Crane Tech Park, there are over 64 plus companies, with the majority of them being defense contractors that support the Crane Naval Support Center. Purdue at Westgate strives to be that regional hub of connection and support to these companies. The intention is to highlight the defense contractors within our region and state to help promote their technology and capabilities to startups or small businesses that would have interest in potentially collaborating with them as well as to help introduce new talent for future employees or universities or currently employed. So today's webinar, Quantum Computing Quantified, What Is It and What It Can Do, will be presented by Gideon Bass. Gideon is a lead scientist of the Strategic Innovation Group with the defense contractor, Booz Allen Hamilton. We are excited to have a satellite office of Booz Allen Hamilton within the Westgate, Westgate at Crane Technology Park supporting Naval Support Activity Center at Crane. We ask that you please mute your microphones. If you choose to have your video on, that's fine during the presentation. If you should have a question, please utilize the chat function at the bottom of the screen and Gideon will answer those questions directly after the presentation. The presentation and recording of the webinar will also be sent to you following this presentation. With no further ado, I would like to welcome Gideon. Hi, give me one second while I uh, share my slides. Uh, I did want to start by saying that unfortunately, to the best of my knowledge, quantum computing does not help with Zoom links. Uh, it, uh, <laughs> It's, it's a very exciting technology, but it's actually, you know, maybe an important theme that it, it, it doesn't do, solve all computer problems. It solves very specific problems. So uh, without any uh, further to do, uh, quantum computing quantified. So first about me, uh, I have a PhD in physics from George Mason. I've been a lead scientist at Booz Allen Hamilton since 2016 when I joined the firm. Uh, I do sort of a combination of AI and machine learning and quantum computing. I have a couple of publications that I link here. I list uh, my email address here, glad to talk with anybody on the uh, call who's interested in, in further uh, talk, uh, discussion. And while Booz Allen does have a, uh, a satellite office um, in Indiana, I am uh, located in the Washington DC metro area. Okay, so quant I, quantum information, sort of a history. I wanted to, to start my talk by giving a little bit of history uh, of quantum computing and quantum information to sort of give you a context of what this technology is, why we're talking about it now. Quantum today is like computation was in the 50s. So if you think about you know, computers in the 1950s, they were these sort of gigantic, opaque monstrosities that most people didn't really understand. And to be honest, weren't actually that useful. The very first computers could, were these incredibly expensive devices that you could, that were about the equivalent of a couple you know, smart people you know, running through the computations by hand uh, themselves. But people realized that, hey, the computers are going to get better and better. The, the mathematicians doing the equations on pen and pencil aren't particularly going to get faster. And that's really where quantum computers are now. They're these big bulky devices. They have a lot of sort of intricacies. The engineering is still being uh, developed significantly, but we're already seeing like, you know, that they are growing in, in power and capability. Uh, our understanding of how to use them is, is growing rapidly. And so it's a really sort of exciting time to be thinking about these devices. 
again, sort of thinking about this timeline, right? The the first uh, junk, you know, PN junction, sort of the the hardware backdrop of a computer developed in the 40s, first integrated circuit in the 50s. Uh, you start getting, you know, a couple of thousand transistors in the 70s, tens of thousands in the 80s, up till now when you have billions of transistors. Quantum computers are on a much sort of are sort of on this delayed time scale. The first proposal of it. Uh, was made in the 80s as a sort of saying, hey, you know, there's these problems that just don't seem to be working well on classical computers. What if we had a computer that was based off of the principles of quantum mechanics? Um, and people sort of thought about it. And then in the 90s, a couple of theorit theoreticians came up with algorithms sh showing that if you had a, a computer that operated in these quantum mechanical properties that we'll talk about a little bit later on, if you had a computer that operated like this, then you could get significant speed ups. The problems that took you know, years or millennia could be done in hours or minutes. Uh, and that really is sort of that, that theoretical argument sort of encouraged a lot of the hardware companies to say, hey, let's start, start building these things and, and see if we can actually develop them. And so you start getting devices built in the 2000s um, and you really start getting significant um, acceleration into the to the 2010s um, and, and really the past two to three years um, there's just been enormous uh, progress so you know we've been doing computing since you know the 50s you know our computers work pretty well zoom problems notwithstanding uh, so you know why should we be caring about quantum computers you know why should we try to spend all this time and effort to completely redo the way we do computing computation. If classical computers, you know, our, our traditional computers, you know, this laptop that I'm, I'm speaking to you out of, you know, for a lot of things work perfectly well. Well, I think there's sort of really two motivations. Um, and both of them have to do with the fact that computers are running into sort of limits. So the first one is sort of a physical limit, which is that for basically since the 50s, we have been able to rely on something called Moore's Law, which is that every roughly 18 months, the power of a computer, of, of the state of the art computer will roughly double. Um, this is not a fundamental physics law, it's just sort of an obser observed fact that this has tended to happen. And we've sort of been able to assume that it will happen. And the problem is we are running into fundamental limits that you cannot make transistors any smaller because we're approaching the size of individual atoms. We're running into limitations on heat, on power, on size, you just can't get these you know, traditional computers to have this more computational power in the same amount of space or the same amount of power in, in that space. So, you know, th that's sort of one problem. We can't rely on Moore's law to continue. And in fact, we have seen that basically Moore's law seems to have ended roughly five years ago. Okay, so that's one argument, one motivation. And the second motivation is scaling, which is that there are problems that even with Moore's law, like growth happening for another 50 years, we will never be able to solve. So computer scientists like to think about problems as sort of, a, you know, the difficulty of a problem is a function of how many, you know, inputs there are. You know, if there's 10 inputs or 100 inputs, how much does that change? And there are problems that scale, you know, like two to the X, where X is the, the input size, or even X to the X. Um, that at any decent input size, 40, 50 prop, you know, things, 100 things, be, requires so many computations, so many calculations, that even a, you know, again, Moore's law like growth for 50 years, the biggest possible supercomputer will never solve these problems. And these are problems that are important. These are problems like logistics, like protein folding, like machine learning, like combinatory optimization. Uh, you know, discovering new drugs, something, you know, in the era of COVID we've all been thinking about, um, you know, re relies on computational models. So without, uh, you know, some sort of new technology, there will be problems that we just cannot solve or we cannot solve exactly. And, you know, we're humans, we see a challenge and we say, we wanna solve that, so how do we do it? And one possible answer is quantum computing. So quantum computers were first proposed by Richard Feynman in the early 80s as a way to sort of model quantum systems. 
people were thinking about problems in chemistry and physics and material design, um, atomic physics, and trying to understand these things. And we're realizing that you know, these, these problems obeyed the laws of quantum mechanics, not the laws of classical mechanics. And we're basically, it took, you know, a traditional computer just could not solve them. So Feynman said, hey, what if we had a quantum computer, a computer that operated on the principles of quantum mechanics instead of you know, more classical physics? Um, and then in the early 90s, uh, Peter Shore, then at uh, MIT, I think, uh, developed a algorithm for factoring um, that he was able to show that you could solve the prime factorization problem with a quantum computer in a or, you know, exponentially less time than you, than you could with a traditional computer, which had some major implications for cybersecurity that I'll talk about a little bit later. And that's really when big money started getting involved. Uh, interest is further uh, peaked. Uh, Grover, uh, Love Grover developed a sorting algorithm. Um, uh, Hidetoshi Nishimori uh, developed a conceptual basis for quantum kneeling. You know, these theoretical things started happening in the 90s. And then in the 2000s, you started getting hardware. Um, in particular, a Canadian startup called D-Wave uh, was founded in 1999. And in 2011, they announced the first commercially available quantum computer, uh, which they called uh, quantum manure, called the D-Wave 1. The particular device was highly controversial. Some people claimed, you know, we're, we're not certain whether it was quantum or not. Uh, but for about 11 years, for about seven years, it was the only, it, it was a quantum device that people could use. And so people started using it and saying, hey, it does this thing cool. And, you know, it doesn't, it has the speed up. It doesn't have the speed up. There's a lot of papers going back and forth in the literature about it. Uh, and then in 2018 and 2019, IBM, uh, startups like Rigetti and IonQ start uh, releasing their own devices. Uh, Google builds a device. Um, just this past year, uh, Honeywell has announced that they have a device. So you're starting to see uh, more and more companies, both sort of traditional uh, you know, uh, giants, excuse me, plus startups developing uh, hard quantum hardware and you know, putting it out there for people to use. And that gets a lot of people really excited, like, hey, this isn't just some you know, theoretical thing that you know, a couple academics have written papers on. This is an actual physical device. I can see it. I can you know, write code on it. Uh, you know, gets people uh, pretty interested. So that's sort of the, the history of, you know, you know, we went from theory all the way to actual devices. So why should we, you know, so, so what is a quantum computer? And, you know, we talked about the motivation is that it's faster, but how, how is it faster? A quantum computer is a device that takes advantage of the quantum properties of qubits to perform certain types of calculations extremely quickly compared to conventional computers. So, First of all, I just wanted to give a couple sort of definitions here, which is I've been going back a little bit back and forth between quantum information or, um, and quantum computing. This talk is primarily focused on quantum computing. That's the area that receives the most buzz, but quantum computing is part of a larger category of quantum information. So you have quantum computing, which is itself divided into quantum annealing and gate model quantum computing. But then you also have quantum communication, which is sending information from one place to another uh, via uh, qubits. And you have quantum sensing, which is using the, the principles of quantum mechanics to build you know, better, more sensitive sensors. So I'll talk about those as well uh, in, in briefly. Okay, so first of all, I just wanted to talk, you know, um, give you guys the brief, you know, how to talk about quantum, you know, at your next dinner party or, uh, you know, something like that. You know, there's a lot of information out there about quantum computers. Uh, you see articles in popular media and pop sci. Um, you see people, you know, who are, you know, really hyping this stuff up at, or not fully understanding it. And it the 
quantum computing relies on the, the principles of, of quantum mechanics, which is an area of physics that is fairly poorly understood by a lot of people. Um, and so you get a lot of things that um, they're just sort of misleading. And so I wanted to sort of start by clarifying a couple key facts. So first of all, some quantum facts, uh, it, what it will do, it will solve specifically engineered problems that cannot be solved by traditional computers. It will end the effectiveness of existing public key encryption in the next couple of decades. Uh, it will likely enable breakthroughs in AI, machine learning, signal processing, search, chemistry, optimization, linear algebra. Uh, it will change the way we do communication. Uh, it will change, it will enable more, you know, higher precision in sensors. Um, there's also two terms here right at the bottom that I wanted to talk about, quantum teleportation and quantum supremacy. Uh, these are both real terms that are used by people in the field and they are used in very limited senses. Um, and often again, when they get translated to the, the general public, there's a lot of misunderstanding there, right? Quantum teleportation does not mean that you can, you know, teleport people, you know, that we're going to have Star Trek style teleporters and we're going to, you know, beam people up to space or whatever. Um, it's a sort of term of art for a specific type of way of sending information from one place to another. Uh, quantum supremacy, again, does not mean that quantum computers make all existing computer problems obsolete. Rather, uh, we'll talk about it a little bit, but rather it means that a quantum computer can do a problem that a classical computer cannot. Um, so again, things that quantum can't do, it doesn't allow us to instantly solve all problems. Um, it probably will not completely replace traditional computing. Um, it's going to be sort of a supplement to existing computing. Um, also, if you hear anything involving wormholes, bending space time, um, that's probably not you know, really accurate fourth dimension, um, you know, Star Trek style teleportation, faster than light communication, quantum doesn't help with any of that. Uh, if you hear sh about Schrodinger's cat, um, that's, you know, probably not um, directly relevant here. Um, you know, using quantum to solve, you know, the theory of everything, uh, probably not going to happen. Okay, so what can a quantum computer could do? It can achieve massive advances in chemistry and material design. It can break modern encryption and it can improve logistics and optimization. These are sort of three of the key areas. There's certainly more. I show here a, an image uh, from Gartner um, showing you know, use cases of quantum computing in science and algorithms in simulation and chemistry and machine learning. Um, so these, those are sort of the key areas, but there's lots of other areas where certainly there's interesting potential. So we start with uh, material science and chemistry. There is a known problem in, in chemistry that in, quant in sort of quantum chemistry, which is the study of chemistry at quantum levels. So, you know, talking about, you know, you've got two mo complicated molecules and they're interacting with each other and you're trying to figure out what, what will happen, which is that it is basically impossible to model what will happen computationally. Um, if you have anything more complicated than basically a hydrogen atom with an electron, a single electron orbiting around it, anything more complicated than that, we cannot computationally figure out exactly what will happen. We can do some approximations in simple cases, but basically for any complicated chemistry or, uh, situation, the only way to do it is to physically create the thing and then see what happens. And what this means is that developing things like new molecules, new materials, new drugs, um, is a very time, labor, and money ex uh, extensive uh, process. And if we want to have more rapid advances in new technologies, we need new approaches. These simulations just are, are failing. So the idea is, well, a quantum computer fundamentally is doing things at a quantum level. Uh, so it should be able to sort of naturally uh, simulate these um, environments in a way where a classical computer has to be using lots of approximations to get close to it. A quantum computer can just do it very elegantly and very easily. Um, so this is probably the, the sort of lowest hanging fruit of um, where quantum could sort of help. Another area is in encryption. Um, it is, so this goes back to Shor's algorithm, which I mentioned uh, a few slides ago. 
So Peter Shore in the uh, in, in the in the 90s uh, was able to develop an algorithm. He showed that if you had a large, um, well-built quantum computer that you know performed you know met certain specifications, it could do the integer factorization problem, which is you take some you know large number, say um, you know three. 3 million, uh, sorry, 36,526,891. And you tell me what are its prime factors and you know, the computer spits out 5,881 and 6,211. Now I couldn't do that in my head, but with a computer like that amount I could do, but um, you know, something, you know, a couple orders of magnitude, it turns out even with really, really good computers, even with supercomputers, if you've got a fairly large number, it is almost impossible to just figure out its prime factorization. And the fact that that is impossible, like, so, okay, a computer, a quantum computer can do this. Why do I care? Like, it's a cool math, it's an interesting math problem, but, you know, I stopped caring about arithmetic problems, you know, a while ago for most things. The reason we care is that most of our uh, computer encryption relies on the fact that computers cannot solve this problem. So when I, you know, talk to my bank and I say, hey, bank, you know, please transfer, you know, this amount of money out of my account and, you know, pay, you know, my mortgage company, you know, you know, pay, you know, pay off my mortgage. That message is encrypted so that if anybody, so that nobody else can read it and say, oh, you know, Gideon Bass has a bank account number, of whatever, and a password of whatever, and this amount of money in his account, right? That's not information I want to be generally known. And the way we keep it from being generally known is through public key encryption. And public key encryption relies on the fact that nobody can do this factoring. Well, now Peter Shor has proven that if you had the right type of quantum computer, you could in fact uh, perform, you could in fact perform this factorization and you could break uh, encryption. So that's sort of you know, a, a, a huge problem. And we'll talk a little bit later about some of the solutions here, but. Basically, the options are either leading, you know, figuring out what the problem is, and you know, developing mitigation strategy, making sure we, you know, we are in the forefront uh, of the quantum future, or letting somebody else um, get there first and, and having a major problem. Uh, and then finally, uh, solving optimization problems. So there's lots of optimization problems. I have a picture here of a um, wedding venue. Uh, you could imagine one optimization problem might be you're having a big wedding and you, you've invited all of your family and friends and you need to make sure that, you know, that your, your, you know, your, your relatives who hate each other aren't at the same table and your friends from, you know, one place are all in the same table so they can talk to each other and, and, and the, these two people who are exes are, you know, different, far apart so they don't get into a huge fight. Um, all of that is an optimization problem, right? Um, you know, we might deal with, you know, you know, Booz Allen might deal with clients who are having optimization problems in logistics or, um, you know, you're targeting or, 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 you know, building new, you know, industrial engineering, lots of different areas where optimization, optimization problems exist. And it turns out these problems are comp computationally, again, very, very hard. You can get pretty good answers using a traditional computer, but it is very hard to get the best answer. And quantum computers approach these problems differently and offer the possibility of providing probably fairly small improvement. But the thing is these problems are so big that a 1% improvement might mean millions or billions of dollars or you know, thousands of hours of people hours saved or you know, lives in some cases. So it's, it's a very uh, important issue in another area where quantum could potentially have a lot of interest. Okay, so that sort of is quantum computing, sort of some of the applications of quantum computing. So I want to next talk about, um, you know, how, you know, a little bit about, a little bit of intuition about why quantum computers can do these things that a classical computer can't. And I think the best way of figuring out, developing this intuition is saying, well, hey, a quantum computer is just doing computations. Can you just simulate a quantum computer using a traditional computer? And then we don't need to build all of this new hardware. And the math of quantum mechanics is actually quite simple. It's basically um, linear algebra. Um, and, but the underlying um, you know, vectors and matrices leads to some very, very 
bad scaling. So a, a quantum computer at any given time can be described by a series of complex numbers. Um, and that the number of complex numbers is two to the n number of qubits, where a qubit is the fundamental unit of, of quantum processing, just like a bit is the fundamental unit of classical processing. So if I have one qubit, I only need two complex numbers or 32 bytes of information. That's not too bad. If I have 10 qubits, I need 1,000 uh, complex numbers or 16 kilobytes. That's still you know, pretty trivial for a traditional computer. If I have 40 qubits, I need this many, uh, I don't remember whether that's trillions or quadrillions of uh, uh, complex numbers to, to describe it, or 17 terabytes of memory to describe it. So you know, just 40 qubits is already getting to you know, supercomputer sized problems just to fully describe the computational, the state of the system not to actually do the computation. Simulating 70 qubits would require roughly the world's entire internet traffic from 2020 to, to just to represent. So you could see, you know, very quickly, traditional computers cannot just, you, you can't just replace a quantum computer with a simulation of a, of a classical computer. And so it's not surprising that, um, in 2019, when we started getting to around 50 qubits, that's when we achieved something called quantum supremacy. So quantum supremacy is the situation in which a, a problem that cannot be solved by a classical supercomputer in some reasonable amount of time has been solved by a quantum computer. Uh, so again, Google achieved this in, in, announced in a paper in October that they had achieved this uh, with 53 qubits. Uh, and sort of a, a couple of key notes here, right? What this means is that they have solved a problem that a classical computer can't. The actual problem they solved is essentially uh, um, predict the output of a quantum computer. Um, it's not something that's useful or interesting, um, but it's sort of an important stepping stone on the way to saying a quantum computer has solved a problem that is important that we cannot solve with a classical computer. So that's still sort of the next goal. Um, in December of 2020, uh, China uh, made its own claim to have achieved uh, quantum supremacy as well. Okay, so I've mostly been talking about quantum computing, but I did want to talk briefly about communication and sensing as well, because these are also really important uh, areas. So what is quantum communication? It's the field of quantum information sciences that studies how to use quantum mechanics to uh, transfer information. So, you know, encryption is changing. I talked about, you know, Shor's uh, algorithm and how it breaks existing uh, uh, encryption. So one key part of quantum communication is figuring out how does encryption, what does encryption look like in an area where we cannot rely on current public key encryption uh, algorithms? Um, is that you know we just come up with some new algorithm, or is that we completely reinvent how we do um, uh, encryption? So those are sort of two options. Quantum communication, though, is more than just cryptography. Uh, quantum communication means increased information density. Um, it allows something called a quantum network, which could perform distributed quantum uh, communication, but also distributed quantum co computation. Um, There'll be a new new information resources like entanglement, and, and you know you'll talk about how much entanglement you can produce, just like you'll talk about how much memory or speed uh, a particular connection has. Um, so it, it offers a, a change in the way we do communication. I did want to talk a little bit about post quantum crypto because the the short al uh, algorithm slide always gets people freaked out, like oh no encryption's doomed, like what's going to happen. Um, there are two uh, sort of leading theories. So again, the, the current public key security regime fails utterly. So what do we do? Well, NIST is currently developing and improving classical encryption techniques that are, will, will not be vulnerable or should not be vulnerable to a uh, quantum-based attack. But there's a long road ahead in adopting these new techniques and speed is of the essence. 
So it's really important, um, you know, if you are in government, if you're consulting with government, um, if you're, you know, managing networks, to be thinking about switching over to these new algorithms, because, you know, one of the key things with cryptography is that there's an idea called the, you know, information, you know, security uh, shelf, you know, um, shelf life, right? You know, if, if I, you know, go back to the the analogy of, you know, my bank account information, right? In five years, there's a pretty decent chance that my bank account, you know, number will still be the same. There's a decent chance I still won't want people to know how much money I had in my bank account five years ago. You think about, you know, military, you know, DOD, you know, security issues, um, you know, information, like certainly classified information has a shelf life. So it's important that we uh, switch over to post-quantum cryptography well, well before a quantum computer that can break Shor's, that can use implement Shor's law is developed. And so that's something, you know, that we are, you know, certainly advising a lot of people and, and we encourage you to be thinking about. Um, so that's post-quantum crypto. There's also something called quantum key distribution, um, which is a cryptographic protocol that involves quantum mechanics to ensure security and privacy. Um, it's important to note, uh, you know, you may hear about this a fair bit, but it's important to note that the, uh, the security of quantum key distribution requires you know, certain key criteria to be met, and it only provides security against very specific types of cryptographic eavesdropping. Um, it doesn't prevent your signal from being jammed. It doesn't prevent you know, non-cryptographic based attacks. I have a, a comic here, right? The, uh, the quintessential, you know, I'm gonna hit, hit, hit the person who knows the information with a wrench until they tell me their password. Um, you know, quantum key distribution does nothing against that. It does nothing against you know, social engineering based attacks. Um, so for for these reasons, actually, you know, there's been sort of less of a, a interest in that in, in the U.S. Um, but certainly, it's an important technology that you will hear people talking about quite a bit. Uh, and then quantum sensing, uh, I just wanted to talk about briefly. So first of all, you are using quantum sensors on a daily basis. Uh, GPS satellites uh, use quantum sensors to uh, make sure that they know exactly where they are and what time it is. And uh, so whenever you, know, you go out and you ask your phone to navigate you from point A to point B, you are using a quantum sensor. Um, lasers, atomic clocks, and more. A lot of things that we are, you know, we've been using for a fairly long time are technically quantum sensors. Uh, but you know, there's, there's definitely room to improve them. And in particular, there's an effort to use uh, entanglement. So most of the, the sensors we've talked about, like lasers or atomic clocks, uh, use some quantum mechanical properties, but they don't use the entanglement property. Um, and so that's sort of been something that has been growing more recently uh, and uh, is sort of a really interesting and exciting area. Okay. So I wanted to uh, finally sort of, you know, conclude with, you know, a look to the future. Uh, quantum, I, I love this quote, quantum computing is heavily hyped and evolving at different rates, but should not be ignored. So quantum computers um, today uh, are, some, you sometimes hear the, out, the uh, acronym NISC, Noisy Intermediate Squ Scale Quantum Devices. Basically, you know, this means that they have noise that, uh, you know, with, you know, my traditional computer, I don't really worry about if I send some instruction that they, that instruction doesn't happen. There are errors or bugs, but it's not because the instruction I sent doesn't happen. It's because somehow the instruction I sent wasn't the correct instruction to send. Um, but the, the hardware itself, we generally sort of assume function does whatever we program it to. Quantum computers right now aren't at that point. We're still working on the engineering to build them. Intermediate scale, the largest devices uh, currently are on the order of 50 to 60 qubits. To do something really useful, we probably need hundreds or thousands of, of qubits. Um, Shor's algorithm uh, will need you know, tens of thousands, maybe even more, uh, or sorry, tens or even hundreds of millions of qubits. Um, so we really need to, you know, some problems are going to need to wait until we have 
uh, what are called robust fault tolerant quantum computing, um, large scale uh, fault tolerant. Uh, and in some ways that's a good thing, right? It means we have a little bit of time to prepare, particularly when we think about the, the cryptographic um, implications. But it also means, you know, you, but these NIST devices have things that they can be useful for now. And so it's it, valuable to be thinking about that, uh, you know, right now. Uh, where are we going? You know, we're, quantum computers seem to be achieving Moore's law-like growth. Uh, this is a chart from IBM. Um, they uh, measure something called quantum volume, which is related to, but not exactly equal to uh, the number of qubits. Um, and they've been showing that, you know, they've been doubling roughly, you know, eight, every 18 months. Uh, other organizations are making similar advances. And again, you know, okay, you know, the thing with exponential growth that we found with traditional computers is, you know, it's faster than you think. Um, right, you know, the devices are sort of primitive or primitive and then all of a sudden they're, they're really big and, you know, you have internet and, and Zoom and, and virtual environments and social media and all of these things that computers have done for us. Quantum is going to do that um, and it's going to happen sooner than we think. So, some concluding thoughts. Quantum offers an entirely new paradigm of computing and information process. It's coming, it's important, it's new, and it's big. It isn't fully mature yet, but the time to start preparing for it is now. So how could you get involved? And wow, well, is Booz Allen involved? Uh, if you're a you know, government employee, uh, you should be thinking about the time scale and scope of your problems. And if you know, dealing with quantum makes sense, uh, you, know, you should be making sure you have a plan in place for a quantum future. If you're a contractor, um, now's the time to be getting smart on quantum and we'd love to do partnerships. Uh, this field is so new, it's not really a, an area where people are comp competing with each other. We're all trying to figure it out together and work together. So I'd love to talk with other contractors or uh, um, organizations um, and you know, figure out, you know, is there research that we can do together? Are there proposals we can work on together? Um, you know, you know what, what does that look like? And then I know there's uh, some students uh, might be on the line. Uh, if you're interested in quantum, you know, I encourage you to take technical classes. Um, and when you graduate, check out um, government consulting. It's, it's a cool area. Um, and I provided a link to uh, the Booz Allen uh, quantum uh, uh, site. And, and if you're uh, interested in any, checking out more about uh, our organization, uh, please check it out. Uh, and I conclude by saying that I would be glad to answer any questions that anyone might have. Thank you. Great, great. <clears throat> Thank you, Kitty. And we do have a couple questions. So, um, and they were early on, so it may refer back to some of the earlier things that you said, but does, qu does quantum computing have the energy usage problem? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. And I would say it is unclear, uh, at least to me, whether quantum computers are going to be better, worse, or the same as uh, traditional computing in terms of energy use, right? So, you know, one of the problems with, you know, doing, you know, large scale computation, right, is these computers require a lot of energy. Um, they also produce a lot of heat. And so then you need to spend, but need to operate at low temp, you know, at reasonably low temperatures. So then you need to do air conditioning. And quantum computers have some of the same thing. Um, most of the existing hardware implementations actually require extremely low temperatures. And by extremely low, I mean a couple of fractions of a degree above absolute zero. Um, so, um, you know, there is a, you know, a decent, quite a bit of energy usage in um, keeping these devices very, very cold. Um, on the other hand, you know, if you go from something that requires an exponential number of calculations to a polynomial number of calculations, then be, you know, be gaining the, the energy advantage. Um, you know, I, I'd say a lot of the problem, you know, that makes it hard to say is you know, with, with traditional computers, we've basically been building chips the same way for 50 years, right? We do silicon-based transistors. Um, with quantum computers, there are a half dozen different serious, you know, well-researched, well-developed ideas for how you build a qubit. Um, that rely on a fundament, you know, fundamentally different types of things. Is it a loop of superconducting uh, metal? Is it, you know, photons? Is it light particles that are trapped? Is it 
charged particles that are, you know, that are put in, into, you know, magnetic traps. Like these are completely different uh, hardware implementations and they will have very different, you know, senses, um, and they will have different advantages and disadvantages. And we're still trying to figure out, you know, and sort of the field is trying to coalesce to what is the thing that makes the most sense? Um, is it some hybrid of different things for different purposes or is there one that will clearly outperform the others? And we're not there yet. <laughs> what do you think about Purdue University PBITS machine? Uh, I will admit that I am not familiar with that machine, so I don't want to um, comment one way or the other. Uh, okay, yeah. we'll, um, we'll get you the information of the gentleman and introduce you to. And you guys can, yeah, you can speak about it further. To talk about it more, I'm just not familiar with, with that device. Okay. Uh, how much physical knowledge is needed for a computer scientist to get involved in yeah, quantum computing? So that, that's a great question. One of the fascinating things about being in quantum computing right now is that there's basically no, almost nobody who comes into quantum computing from a quantum computing background, right? There's like a couple programs in the country that have like quantum information PhDs. Um, so most of the people in, who are in the field are coming from either physics or, you know, either the physical sciences or the computational sciences or mathematics. Um, but nobody has all of those backgrounds. And so I think there, there's definitely, um, you know, places to carve out, um, you know, a, a, a valuable niche for yourself in, you know, no matter what your background is, you know, do you have some, you know, knowledge about specific types of problems? Like that's really useful. Do you have back, you know, strong background in theoretical computer science? That's really useful. Are you a really skilled programmer? That's really useful. Um, so, you, you know, if you're somebody whose background is, in, you know, you could work on, you know, there's areas of developing new um, programming languages, you know, high level programming languages for, for quantum computers that is pure, you know, programming, right? You just, you know, except for you need to know that there's, hey, there's these weird instructions that we need to be able to activate. Um, you know, there are, you know, if you're, a domain expert, you know, you could say, hey, well, here's my problem. And, you know, I need to know just enough about a quantum computer to figure out, can I put that problem into a format that other people have said quantum computers are good at solving, you know, this type of problem. So I think there's lots of different ways that people can, you know, get involved in the field. Um, and it's, again, this goes back to my comment about collaboration. It's really important that we, you know, you know, you know, we see it, be, it being really valuable at Booz Allen to collaborate with other people because we don't have expertise in every single part of quantum computing. We have, you know, a lot of people who know a lot of interesting things, but there's always stuff that, you know, we could learn and uh, we can, can work with, you know, you know here, here's what we have, what do you have that we can, can work together to do something better than either of us could do on our own. Good, good. What exactly do you think would the advantage of quantum in comparison to classical be for machine learning, AI, and maybe natural language processing? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, if I knew the answer, I would publish it and uh, get a lot of citations. Um, there's lots of people who are publishing in this area. Um, and I would say from what I have seen of the literature, the answer is maybe. Um, basically, right? You know, um, there are people who are trying to develop algorithms for, you know, parts of machine learning, right? You know, you know right? In machine learning, right? There's a, there's a number of different challenges in machine learning, right? One of the challenges is getting big data sets. Quantum doesn't seem to really, you know, doesn't really help with that. Um, another problem in, in machine learning though is, you know, a lot of you know, the, the algorithms that we use run into computational bottlenecks, right? It takes a really, really long time for the machine to study all that data and then learn well from that data to, to match, you know, do pattern matching and, and feature recognition and things like that. And that's where quantum could potentially have um, some areas, right? It's, it's good at doing, you know, parallel processing. Um, it's good at, you know, speeding up, you know, bottlenecks. It's just, you know, one thing again, I, I sort of want to emphasize is that Quantum computer, you, you can't just take some classical algorithm, run it on a quantum computer and expect it to be faster. The way quantum computers get speed up is that they do computation in a different way. So you take some problem, 
you figure out a different way of running it with your quantum computer than you run it with your classical computer, such that you need to do less steps. Um, so the trick is going to be finding that machine learning algorithm that you know takes less steps. You know, finding that bottleneck and then finding a way of doing it better um, computationally. Uh, and I will I will sort of conclude with one last thought on the, on the machine learning issue, which is that. In classical machine learning for NLP problems, uh, it was mentioned, but also computer vision, the state of the art is, is deep learning, right? You, you take some really, really big, deep uh, neural network, uh, and you know, that has won, you know, basically wins every competition. And that's how you know, Facebook and Google, they're, they're all using deep neural networks. If you ask somebody to prove that a deep neural network was faster than, say, you know, a random forest algorithm for that problem, Nobody in the world can prove like on pen and paper that it's faster or better. But we, everybody uses it because it works better. And so the, the challenge with quantum computers is there are probably algorithms that turn, will turn out to be better on a quantum computer than the existing classical one. But unless you can prove it from, from you know, pen and pe paper based theory, you can't, there, there's no, nothing else you can do right now because the hardware is still so small that you can't just you know, implement it and say, hey, let's see what happens. Does it work better? Does it work worse? And this is like a very small toy sort of tailored problem. Um, now that's changing rapidly, but right now that sort of has slowed the ability to say, oh yeah, you know, it's definitely better, it's definitely worse because the only way to do that is very rigorous proof rather than you know, empirical evidence. Good. We still have a couple more questions, and then, then we'll conclude. Uh, obviously, we're, we'll provide you with his contact information because there, there might be a lot more questions that you'll have after the fact. But uh, one question is, which specific use cases will get benefited by QTRITs or QDITs? Yeah. Um, so, you know, a, a QTRIT or a QDIT, right, is going to be a, a three or four. So, okay, let, let me step back just a little bit. So, in classical computing, pretty much everybody uses bits, right? Which are, you know, it's, you can think of it as like an on-off switch, right? Zero or one. Uh, for a while, there was some um, research in, in, you know, trits, you know, trinary or quad, you know, so they could be zero, one, or two. Um, and you, know, you could think of trinary as being zero, one, or maybe, um, you know, yes, no, or maybe, or you could think about it as just being these three, three levels that you can do. And I'm not an expert in the history of classical computing, but my vague understanding is that these things were sort of interesting, people poked around at them, but were generally found to not give any particular particular use or advantage. And so, you know, we basically stuck with, with bits. Uh, so in quantum computing, you have a qubit, uh, which can be zero or one, and has the added thing that it can be in the superposition state where it is both zero and one simultaneously. So a qtrit would just be a trinary, uh, you know, it could be zero, one, two, or it could be some superposition of all three of those things. Um, and I'm, I'm amused by my auto captioning is having quite a bit of difficulty with <laughs> the, the, this particular <laughs> bit of discussion here. Um, but um, I think, you know, uh, you know, looking at that, um, what I would say is that, um, Again, you know, uh, my, my intuition would be that the, we will find the same thing in QTRITs that we found with, with trinary. Hey, it's kind of cool and interesting, but it's probably not going to give any significant computational advantage. Um, but you know, classical you know, quantum computing is different enough from classical computing that it's certainly possible. I think it's an interesting area of research. It's not something that I will claim to have a great deal of expertise on. Um, but as far as I know, it is not generally considered, you know, it, it, it's an interesting area, but um, certainly I don't see it being something that there's uniform consensus that it's going to be valuable, but maybe it could be. Okay, good. All right, great questions. Last question. Yeah. When will quantum computing be available at home? In 20, 30, 40, or 50 years? That's a good question. So it depends on what you mean at home. Um, in one way, quantum computing is already available at home via the cloud, right? Um, so you can go to, you know, IBM's website or a couple other organizations and, you know, log, you know, AWS actually has um, a, you know, you, you know, just like, you know, AWS, you can get like a, a classical instance. 
you can get a quantum instance. Um, you know, they have some you know standard rate that they charge, and you know, run a quantum com uh, computation if you want to right now. Um, you know, from your personal laptop. Um, you need to know you know a little bit of Python, a little bit of how to use AWS, and you know, you're done. You just run a quantum computing a quantum computation from your laptop. Um, if you mean you know, people having a physical quantum computer in their room, uh, you know, in their house. My guess, and I want to be clear here, this is, you know, my, my guess, I, I, I don't know that this is the case, but my guess is that that will never be the case. Um, my guess is that the future of quantum computation will always be a cloud-based service. Um, that um, if, you know, you know, the way computation will evolve is you will have your, your classical computer, and if you are doing the kind of thing that needs a quantum you know, uh, computer, you will you know, use a, a cloud-based instance. You will send the specific problem that needs to be solved on a quantum computer to the quantum computer. It will give you a solution. It will send the solution back. And then you will use that solution again on your traditional classical computer to, to do computation. Um, that seems to be the most likely uh, future. It's certainly you know, possible somebody is going to come up with some new hardware implementation for a quantum computer that is really inexpensive and scalable and, you know, amazing. And everybody will just have, you know, quantum, you know, chips on their laptops. Uh, that would be, you know, in, in theory, a quantum computer could do everything a classical computer could do plus more. So if you, get rid of the, you know, if quantum computers and classical computers are equally cheap to make, you will make just quantum computers. Um, but I suspect that quantum computers will always be harder to physically implement than classical computers. And so we will only use a quantum computer if the problem actually requires one. And so that, and it will probably be a, a cloud-based um, situation. Great, great yeah. questions, great engagement uh, by the audience. And Gideon, we want to thank you for, for presenting this information. Quantum computing is definitely a concentrated technology within the DOD, as well as several other industries. Uh, if you are a startup, if you are a student, uh, if you are an established business that wants to learn more about Booz, Hel Booz Allen Hamilton and this technology, please reach out to them. They're, they're obviously wanting to collaborate with people, so we're and we're wanting to encourage that and and help promote that. So uh, again, thank you very much, Gideon. We appreciate you. Appreciate all the audience being here too. I apologize for the technical difficulties earlier. I'm glad we, we get on and try on early so we can figure that out and, and uh, go forward. So I think we, we did okay. We had a good crowd on here. Um, for all of you that don't know more about Westgate Academy, Purdue at Westgate and Defense in Indiana webinar series, please go on to our Westgate Academy website. It's westgate-academy.com. There you'll be able to see the different events and webinars that we have done in the past, as well as the current ones that are happening. So please visit that. And uh, we want to support you. So let us know if there's any way that we can help promote you from a talent perspective or from a small business perspective. We want to be able to make those connections and build those technologies within the, this area. So um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And hopefully you have a great and safe week. And we'll see you in the near future, hopefully in person. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's great talking to you all.